Good afternoon. I'm Larry Rinder. I'm the director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And uh, it's great to have you all here for this really special event that I have been looking forward to for many, many months. Um, I want to thank Sherry Goodman, our director of education, who's here, uh, performing as Usher also at the moment. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for putting this together. Uh, so as you know, uh, what we're going to experience today is uh, a little bit of an experiment in, um, in programming, kind of like the exhibition itself. Uh, Way Bay, as I'm sure you all know, is an exhibition that uh, encompasses about 200 years of Bay Area art and film from our collection, the Bancroft Library and the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, all here on campus. Uh, curated by me, Kathy Garretts, who's our film curator, and David Wilson, our engagement programmer and we brought a rather unconventional approach to organizing the exhibition, uh, selecting the works not based on uh, any kind of sort of received notion of art history uh, or aesthetic um, uh, you know, categories, but more just on the strength of the works themselves. And in the process, we went through hundreds and hundreds of works in the collection, taking things out of crates, uh, opening drawers that hadn't been opened for a very long time. Uh, some of you may be aware that our collection actually goes back to the mid-19th century. The earliest accession dates here at the museum are 1872. So there are things that have been collected uh, for a while and uh, not, not uh, very often seen and often not particularly well documented. So we might just have a name on a slip of paper or something and we're always catching up, but this was a great opportunity to focus specifically on the Bay Area and to see what kind of treasures uh, we could unearth. And that's really the purpose of this program, is to dig a little bit deeper into some of the artists that uh, are in the exhibition, and specifically some of the artists who may not be quite as well known as the Richard Diebenkorns and the Richard Misraks, who are also in the exhibition. But, uh, in this program, and also the one that is happening in May, on May 5th, we wanted to shine a light, uh, however briefly, on a few artists, um, just to give you a, a taste of, um, you know, the potential greatness there. And I hope you'll go on to re do more research on your own. So each one of these presentations is really uh, quite small. They're meant to be small bites. It's like tapas uh, teaching, in a way. Um, we told them 15 minutes, they may go over, we'll see. Uh, so before I introduce the, uh, the, the folks, and I'm gonna introduce them all before they come up, I just wanna thank our supporters uh, who made the exhibition possible, Nyon McAvoy and Leslie Berriman, Alexandra Bose and Stephen Williamson, Rena Branston, Gertrude Parker, Janie and Jeff Green, the Jay DeFeo Foundation, and many, many other people, including possibly some of you here in this room. So thank you very much if you supported the show. So uh, I will, again, introduce all four of the speakers, and then they'll just come up one after the other. I think they know their order. If they don't, Sherry can be traffic control. Uh, Kevin Killian is going to talk about Harry Jacobus. Kevin, where are you? Someplace. There you are. Hi, Kevin. Uh, Kevin is a wonderful human being. Uh, and he's also a novelist, a poet, a playwright, and a, an art writer who has blogged on a variety of topics for BAM PFA and also for SF MoMA for their wonderful blog over the years. Uh, he is really a fixture in the Bay Area uh, cultural scene in the art and literature in particular, and we've worked with him quite a number of times before and presented several of his plays here at the museum, so it's great to have you, uh, Kevin. And he's running off early. He's not gonna leave early because of his uh, dismay at the proceedings, but because there's another Harry Jacobus event uh, just down the street. It's a conflict of Jacobus events. Uh, then Jack Van U will address Ludwig Choris, uh, and Jack, hi Jack, uh, has been the curator at UC Berkeley's Bancroft Library Pictorial Collection for 20 years. Prior to his time on campus, he was archivist for the Smithsonian Institution's Archives of American Art. His most recent publication is a chapter on San Francisco in the Getty Museum's catalog resume of the mammoth plate photographs of Carlton Watkins, whose work is also in the uh, exhibition. Mark Johnson, hello, Mark. Uh, professor um, of art and gallery director. Are you still all those things? Still professor at San Francisco State University. We'll discuss Saburo Hasegawa, and it's very timely because Mark has just uh, organized an exhibition of Hasegawa and Noguchi, or worked on an exhibition uh, that it opens in Yokohama and then the Queens Museum and then the Asian Museum. Is that right? 
more or less. So it's very exciting. Hasegawa is going to have his moment, but we, we have him first. Um, and we're delighted to hear from Mark about Hasegawa. He received his MFA from UC Berkeley, uh, previously professor at Humboldt State University, and also associate dean of academic affairs at the SF Art Institute. Um, so thank you, Mark. And then our final presenter is Claire Carlevaro. Uh, hi, Claire. Hello. Uh, for over 30 years, Claire owned the Art Exchange in Berkeley, which specialized in resale of modern contemporary artists and showcasing especially work by women artists working uh, from the 20s to the 60s. And uh, her many experience with artists included working, meeting uh, the reclusive, and I think working with maybe just meeting Ruth Wall, uh, but anyway, spending some time with Ruth before her death. And, um, Ruth has probably got to be one of the most obscure artists ever, and so this is such a great treat to have Claire's unique perspective on a wonderful artist that you I'm almost certainly know too little about. So with that, Kevin Killian. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah. These, uh, event, Harry Jacobus isn't spoken of that much, and today there's two, two things. And, you know, I haven't heard his name in years. Um, I've never met Harry Jacobus, but his position in San Francisco art history is unassailable, and his romantic vision has this sort of, oh, I don't know, sublime excess that speaks to me even today. If you find the early romantic pictures of Jess uh, too sincere, you are definitely not man enough to stare down the limpid realities of Jacobus at his most characteristic. With Jess and the poet Robert Duncan, Harry Jacobus founded the legendary King Ubu Gallery on Fillmore Street back in 1953. A few years back, I wrote a piece about Jacobus for the SF MoMA backed online journal, Open Space, and to my shock, I had a quick ping back from Jacobus himself. I was like, oh my goodness, I'm you know in late middle age, but I didn't know him enough to do the ping back thing. He's like a generation older than I am. He was one of the greatest generation and served in Japan at the close of World War II. He went to the Art Institute back when it was still called the California School of Fine Arts, where he met Jess and studied with Clifford Still and David Park. It was a monumental age when one's masters had monumental names, Still, Park. Jacobs didn't sound so impressive, so he added a U and made it Jacobus. Even as Jess Collins dropped his last name entirely. SF MoMA owns nothing by, by Harry Jacobus, but Wei Bay is showing a terrific one, Hellenic blemishes from 1971. Students at CSFA in the late 40s were really jostled by the conflict between the abstract expressionists and the figurative painters. For often, like Jacobus, they were studying with both and one would praise for the same work for which their opposite number would reign scorn. I suppose this is how so many arrived I was just writing this and thinking, I think that's where pop art was born, out of this kind of conflict between these two like implacable you know, gods. Like uh, Rauschenberg, Gustin, Jasper Johns, coming to this absolute impasse and leaping to the top of the chasm to escape. Around the same time, you had the artists like Jess and Jacobus. And this particular painting is like, giant, and from a distance, it bears a resemblance to a classroom map of the 48 states. 
of America itself. Well, I just have like a little Xerox copy of it, but you can see the real thing. You won't be able to tell from here that it might look like the USA map to you once you see the real thing. Broken down into the familiar squares and threshold and rhomboids of our states, the Great Lakes glide across the top center of the picture, rather punching in the Canadian border as though to make the slow climb of New England, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine even more majestic than it would otherwise be. In Jacobus's abstracted, frenzied pointillism, New Jersey's like a perfect California, but backwards as though spying itself in a mirror, while Florida is like a card dealing itself again and again. It's like this, like the Duchamp nude descending a staircase. There goes Florida in bits and pieces. And way out west, we see Harry Jacobus simplifying a complex grid by dividing the spatial areas into big square slabs of nothing only line, no paint. But that's just the way the map of America looks when you cross the Mississippi. And after and enter those squarish states like Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, right? When I was a little boy on Long Island, I used to love maps, especially maps of the East Coast with Long Island on them, where there were so many little states jammed into the into this layout, reflecting what? I wasn't much of a thinker then. Said these state that was it to say that states were originally small, and that by the time the Western states joined the Union, they just became featureless and huge. I didn't get it. You see, and it wasn't thinking of colonialism. It was like the makers had lost interest in detail and the precise. Thus the patriotism of the boy saw the lie of his childhood as the ideal and all else rather colorless. Dodie and I, my wife and I, have a small drawing in oil crayon, crayons at home, a picture by Jacobus. And for years it hung at the opposite end of the bedroom from the bed in which we would, uh, would which he would, uh, kind of rise and stare at its contours, colors, and shapes. Over years, the picture would change. It's, it's, you know this phenomenon when you're seeing something over and over again, something that is half abstract, half figurative. You're going to see things in it every day that you never saw before, things that aren't there. It was like reading tea leaves, an ever-shifting pattern in which one or the other of us would wake the other, startled, I was just looking at that picture and I saw that, I never saw that face in it, did you? That woman screaming for her life. Shh, no, that's just the cat. It's always in the picture, the cat. Go back to sleep. The faces and the significances changing always, but never resolving into pure abstraction. Maybe that was postmodernism, thought I, as a child, looking at the map, thinking, you see a pattern in an artwork when every other fact of the world tells you otherwise, that it's not there. Why are all those countries in Europe so tiny, like Belgium? And the US is so big. Why is Canada so big? Was it that old things were complicated and new things just dumb, like kids, I guess? That was the lesson of Henry James and his repeated story of an uncomplicated American visiting Europe, Europe of a thousand inflections and being changed by it forever. Well, in our case, Duncan, Jess, and Jacobus didn't call it the King Ubu Gallery for nothing. Jacobus developed a distinctive calligram. You can see it in this picture here. And I wish I could draw it for you. It's like a big capital H from the bar of which descends the J. Very similar to the logo which Henry James publishers 
had designed for him back at the turn of the century. So there was always that tension too in this work between the formal and the colloquial, the Bible and the comic strip, the cantata and Tin Pan Alley. You don't have to be Jonathan Katz either to figure that the tensions of pop might have built up and manifested as a result of being gay in a perilous age. Jacobus had no silver spoon. He lived from hand to mouth. When, in the 60s, he found himself in a beautiful house in San Francisco nearby Davies, he was living with an esthetologist whose house it was. It was Jacobus who turned it into a showplace of the antique and the world of tomorrow. Those of you who have seen the um, Pauline Kael house here in Berkeley uh, will know what Jacobus and Jess could do with a few cans of house paint and a box of brightly colored linoleum kitchen tiles. When you go to this house and go to the kitchen, Harry Jacobus took like the brightest colors he could find and made like this, you can't believe, you don't even want to walk on it because it looks like it's alive. It's so rattling with color. Um, you know, red, green, blue, yellow, just bright, bright, bright. And you just like, it's like a game that you'd step away, you're on your way to the sink. So I urge you to go down there and see that. I don't know how he has managed to live into his 90s under the circumstances, except by his talent and by his wits. Harry Jacobus, you turned corners and zigzags into the golden bowls. Here's to you. Thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Jack Fornoy. I have the pleasure of working at the Bancroft and um, I'm ostensibly um, supposed to talk about Shori. Um, I will. Um, we, as Larry pointed out, the Bancroft um, has participated and lent a number of items um, for uh, the Weibei exhibition, and among them it is a shori, not a painting, which I will show, but um, a reproduction from a volume that he um, produced in 1822 after a long uh, circumnavigation. So. I w so what I'm going to try to do, I'm not sure if I'll succeed, is take you on a journey um, that takes us from the dawn of the 19th century, that is around 1803, um, to the first decade of the 21st. And along the way, I'm hoping that, we, well, we will meet or rather have brief encounters with people who had names like Shori, or Horace, Kotzbue, Langsdorf, Rezanov, Douglas, as in Frederick, Curtis, as in Edward, and Ira Nowinski. And um, so, I don't know, uh, put on your life jacket or... <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. Um, so I need to, I wanted to put things, um, let's see if I can, come on a second here. There. Um, I wanted to put Shori a bit 
in the context of um, the great voyages of exploration, um, and particularly the Russian exploration. Um, so just very briefly, since the 17th century, um, Europe had sought a southwest, had sought a northwest passage from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, while the Russian expeditions um, searched for a northeast passage. No passage was found, however, these Russian explorations provided knowledge of places, new places and peoples um, to Europe um, from approximately 1790 to 1840, Russian mariners succeeded in charting the Arctic and Pacific shores of Siberia. They reached beyond Point Barrow in North America, and of course, they landed in the bay, Way Bay. Um, their voyages included important scientific studies, new technologies, and revelations about the peoples of the new world, and thousands of plant and animal identifications for European museums. Now, um, Kreuzenstein was born Ivan Fedorovich Kreuzenstern, and uh, he, he was actually born as Adam Johann Ritter from uh, Kreuzenstern, and he was a German uh, uh, of Baltic. He was a Baltic German, I guess. Um, and he was the first um, lieutenant at, uh, at, the, at that time to command a circum circumnavigation um, for the Russians. This was their first of probably four or five voyages. Um, now, Nikolai Petrovich Retsanov um, has a particular importance with, um, for us to, because he was the founder of the Russian American uh, company and they had a virtual monopoly on the fur trade. And he was the sort of the ambassador um, because at this voyage, they stopped in Japan and trying to establish uh, trade negotiations. Um, a little bit the opposite of what some of us are doing today. Um, so, unfortunately, it didn't really work out. Um, Retsanov ended up having to stay almost under house guard um, in, in Japan, but they did manage to leave, and he was accompanied by Georg Freiherr von Langsdorf, also known as Georg Heinrich von Langsdorf, Baron de Langsdorf, and Grigory Ivanovich Langsdorf. Um, Langsdorf was essentially the ship's a doctor. And um, in 1803, he departed uh, with um, Retzenoff and Kreuzenstern. Um, what was interesting about Retzenoff was um, with Langsdorff, they arrived in San Francisco, well, in the Bay of San Francisco in about 1806. And I have a little drawing. And this is one drawing from 37 of the original drawings that are housed in the Bancroft from this um, uh, voyage. And these are all attributed mostly to Langsdorff, who, among other things, was a doctor, a botanist, 
a naturalist, and something of an artist. Um, so they come to San Francisco, and what you're seeing here is possibly the earliest view by a European um, explorer of what was um, what is now the Presidio. And then Langsdorff actually had a really interesting um, career. He ends up being ambassador, Russian ambassador to Brazil. And um, he unfortunately caught typhus and um, almost died, returned to Germany. He survived the disease, but he was mentally incapacitated um, afterwards. And, um, but he is considered a hero um, in, in Brazil, actually. Now, that was the first voyage. Um, the second one is Otto von Kotzbui, um, Russian naval officer, um, discharted a lot of the a lot of the area. On board, he was accompanied by Adelbert von. Chamiso, or Chamiso, who was French-born, he's a German poet. Um, he wrote a book, uh, I think it's called Schlemiel, Schlemiel and um, it's about a man who sold his shadow. It became quite su successful. And he was um, on board along with um, the ostensible subject of this talk, Shori. Um, Shori was 20 years old when he uh, accompanied um, Kotzbui in 1815. Um, he was born in 1895. And something of a rising star in the Russian art world, that is to say, in, he lived in St. Petersburg, but he w was essentially part of the academy um, obviously very um, precocious and um, according to uh, Shamiso, a bit full of himself. Um, one, the print that you see here in the Way Bay is actually derived from this original watercolor um, and by the way, these are all part of a major collection in the Bancroft, the Honeyman um, collection. Now here, um, this is Shori's impression of what he calls the Danse de Californienne um, at Mission Dolores at this point. And there are some interesting features about this that don't really come through in the printed uh, version. And one of the things is, I'd like to point, look at the size of this cross and how big the buildings are in comparison to these rather impressionistic figures of, um, of Native Americans. Um, it's really as if um, we're looking at a dance that is being contained by the mission and the coming of the conversion of Native Americans and their subjugation, um, which had already taken place. And in a way, for me, this painting represents represents that. Now I want to show you another um, drawing. Now this drawing is by von Langsdorff and this one um, was done about 1806. 
And this shows the Native Americans in the mission of uh, San Jose. Um, it's probably the earliest depiction we have, again, from an explorer. And if you look at the difference between this and this, what you have here is a much more, in my view, almost objectified um, treatment of the natives. They are fairly individualized. They're certainly their, their um, costumes. Uh, you can see how he's paid attention to uh, the, their, uh, the flora here, very precise. Um, one would like to say very German. And then the next picture here, so th this in my view is a more anthropological view. The next one, oops, not that one. So you see the, you know, the, the, the differences and here we go. Yeah. So this is an um, essentially a version, a plate from the book that is on display here at the, um, at the museum in Weibei. Um, one of the things you will notice is that the movement is completely lost in this um, particular uh, rendition. So this was done by someone named Frank Franklin um, after Chory. And it's a lithograph which was a relatively recent development in printing um, at the time. And Chory, when this came out in about 1822, was not terribly happy with the way um, his paintings and his drawings were being um, transferred. Here is another look. Again, um, also uh, by uh, Franklin after Chory. Um, and I guess de Langlum was a rather well-known uh, lithographer at the time. And then here you see another print um, that's also in uh, the exhibition. And this one um, is actually drawn and printed by Chory. And the difference in terms of uh, the figures, the line, and um, sort of the individuality you can see here as opposed to over here. Um, I think this will be part of the next installation, if I may, uh, of, of Weibe. Um, and again, the figures are very static. There is almost a contrapposto um, pose here. Um, very much a European take, I think, on what um, Native Americans looked like. Sometimes some of these drawings, I think, say more about the people drawing them than they do about their actual subjects, which is not quite the same thing when you think of, of Langsdorf. So, Chory, um, there isn't really that much known about him. So this is kind of a switch and bait, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he died when he was 33 years old. He was killed um, in Mexico on another exploratory adventure. Um, he was, uh, they were attacked in, um, like, in, in 1829, I think, and um, by robbers, and he was, he was, uh, uh, he was killed on, on that, going towards the interior, going towards Mexico um, City. Um, what we have now 
really, this is his legacy. The, the prints, um, some of the drawings, and um, some of these quite amazing portraits. So, I've been very interested in how Native Americans, how Aboriginal peoples have been depicted by um, the European explorers and discoverers, and even somewhat, uh, which you'll see later. Um, so, no cameras. This is all before the invention of, uh, of the Gea, 1839. And what you see here is a, is a drawing transcription, if you will, of, of the reality that these artists encountered. Now, um, something completely different. Um, Frederick Douglass, um, it turns out, according um, to this amazing uh, book by John Stauffer, Zoe Trod, who is from Nottingham, who I've had correspondence with, um, she wanted to know if the Bancroft had any particularly interesting um, reproductions of um, Douglas. We don't. Um, and what is really amazing is, is Douglas's attitude towards the camera. Um, he thought of the camera as a as a very um, civilizing, if you will, development as far as the depictions of, quote, the other um, goes. He, um, he was very much, um, he thought that the camera would actually depict the African American in a much more truthful and objective way than the artists of the time had done so, where there were drawings of uh, distorted features, um, almost caricatures, and what he thought that the camera, what Douglas thought the camera would do, was show that the African American was a, a more human than had been um, previously thought of. And of course, Douglas was a great, uh, one of the great abolitionists. And his idea then was he took every opportunity to have himself um, uh, photographed. Um, the other person who I don't show here is Mark Twain, who also uh, took advantage of the camera to publicize himself. But Curtis had a very uh, specific, I mean Curtis, Douglas had a very specific uh, uh, mention. And here is a portrait by Edward Curtis, a uh, Yakut, a chief. Um, Curtis, as you know, it's his sesquicentennial of his birth and he undertook what is probably the greatest um, attempt to document the North American Indian at the time. He produced 20 volumes of prints. Um, you can see these prints. Uh, we have a set. Um, he lost his shirt making this, uh, these portfolios. There are 20 volumes of text and 20 oversized gravure prints that um, Curtis did. And this picture comes from the Library of Congress. And Curtis has both risen and fallen out of favor um, almost simultaneously. Um, one of the um, accusations against Curtis was that he wasn't a very good anthropologist. Um, be that as it may, um, because he dressed people in different costumes and so forth that weren't actually specific. 
And the other thing is that he photographed types um, as opposed to individuals. So now we're going to go into the first decade of the 21st century, and I want to show you a collection that's at the Bancroft on um, Native American portraits. The California Native American in the 21st century, rather grandiose title, but we have over 30,000 digital images and about 1,500 prints, all done by Ira Nowinski, um, supported by the uh, purchase of the prints so that he could continue to photograph. And as far as I know, no one else has done this. And it's not exactly Curtis, but in my view, it's um, uh, a, a more, shall we say, uh, humanizing. These are not types. Most of these people have names. They're named. Um, you know where they come from. Um, and there are some surprising things. Um, this is a uh, ceremony for veterans, Native American veterans. Um, in my, when I look at this, I see a great irony. They're serving the very army that, in <coughs> fact, was responsible for their uh, demise. And yet, there are very many um, Native Americans um, in the service. And then I wanted to show you this, this is a uh, two-generational um, portrait. There are many portraits here of families. And um, again, uh, I like to think of this as a much closer, much more representative way of looking at Native Americans as California Native Americans as they actually appear today. And finally, we have um, Catherine Siva Sobal. She's the founder of the Malki Museum um, on the Morango uh, uh, Reservation. Um, she is considered one of the most important 21st century, what 20th century women um, uh, in California. Uh, she passed away a few years ago. But again, you have a very um, intimate and um, a portrait here. And um, this to me points um, to the future of how we're documenting people and what the Bancroft in particular is trying to do. We're trying to document the communities of California. And um, this is certainly a very important part of our history. In fact, when you enter the museum here, the first thing that Larry has is an, a, a fabulous Ohlone um, basket, which in my view makes perfect sense, uh, both as an object and as now an aesthetic, uh, beautiful um, piece of art. And um, with that, I will leave you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, I want to thank Larry and thank Sherry and thank the Berkeley Art Museum. I'm going to be speaking today about an artist that I don't know how many people have heard of. Anybody know the work of Saburo Hasagawa before today? Well, I'm thrilled to see a few hands in the air, although some of you know of him because of our conversations <laughs> over the years. Um, and. I wanted to say, uh, I first heard the name Saburo Hasagawa in 1989, and I remember it well because I was having lunch with Carlos Villa, whose work is represented in the exhibition here today. 
uh, along with Fred Martin, whose work is represented in the exhibition here today, and Bill Berkson. And we were brainstorming a project called Expanding American Art History to Reflect Multi-Ethnic Diversity eventually. And Fred Martin said, you know, there was a time in the mid-1950s when everything was Hasegawa. And I had no idea who that might be. And it started uh, me on another mission, which was to research our California Asian American art history. And uh, right now, I think the Berkeley Art Museum is ground zero for the most important projects documenting Asian American art history, I think maybe anywhere. So that's why I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, and who was he? Saburo Hasegawa was a brilliant artist, theorist, writer, teacher, and multilingual conversationalist, fluent in international art and philosophy, sometimes said to be the most literate artist of his generation in Japan. Uh, here you see him actually after his move to San Francisco on the right, uh, in kind of his bohemian uh, moment, and on the left is one of his self-portraits. Uh, painted in ink, and we'll talk more about his ink aesthetic as we move into this. During a career as a polymath that was interrupted both by wartime, evacuation, and an early death at age 50, Hasegawa explored art theory and criticism, philosophy and poetry, painting and photography. He wrote his undergraduate University of Tokyo thesis about the 15th century Japanese artist Seshu, and he was a scholar of artists associated with Zen painting uh, who were inspired by Chinese literati traditions, and he studied Buddhism, Taoism, and tea ceremony. But he also introduced European-American abstraction to Japan in a series of essays promoting artists including Mondrian and later Franz Klein. He wrote the first book on European abstract art that was published in Japan. He was initially trained as a fauvist. So this is, these are his works from the early 1930s when he was living in Japan. Uh, not, um, but then he traveled to Paris uh, in 1929, stopping first in San Francisco. And when he came back from his stay in Paris, his work was transformed. And this is the kind of uh, sort of surrealist inflected abstraction that remains his best known work in Japan. Uh, because, again, this was when he wrote this important book on European abstraction that uh, was widely publicized. But privately, during the same period, he started exploring making art with ink. At the beginning of World War II, Hasegawa was arrested as a pacifist and sentenced to a few, spend a few days in jail. After that, he took his family to the countryside, although they had had some wealth. Uh, he moved his family into a chicken coop where they survived the war. Uh, although uh, he subsistence farmed to feed them and the family remembered it was a, a very hungry period. And during this time, uh, he studied classical Asian texts and taught haiku uh, to members of the community where he was working. Uh, he did not, because he had no art materials, they were so poor, he did not return to making art until 1947. Uh, but when he did, uh, his work was uh, vastly transformed, and uh, he started carving kamaboko fish cake trays to create monoprints. Uh, so here he is carving the trays that, you know, when you get a bowl of soup, the fish cake that's sliced in it is the kamaboko and how that's baked. So that was his um, printmaking material. Uh, and that's one of the works sort of inspired by that interest he had in Mondrian uh, that was purchased by, actually by Blanchette Rockefeller and is now in the collection of the Japan Society in New York. Uh, his work explicitly referenced Japanese aesthetics such as yugen, uh, often translated as profundity, but here actually in the gallery guide I was happy to see D.T. Suzuki's translation of yugen as cloudy, impenetrability. Yugen is also described as the subtle aesthetic of the unknowable, the contemplation of the universe's mysteries, the sad beauty of human suffering. So here are two log fragments that Hasegawa carved with the two parts of the compound kanji 
And one example of the Yugen uh, monoprint that he made, there's several of these. Uh, this on the right is an example of, again, that same monoprint technique on a tea screen uh, that he gifted to Isamo Noguchi. Uh, and here it's displayed in Noguchi's home in 1952 in Kitakamakura. And on the left is the wonderful painting that's now on display in the gallery, a gift of Joe Brotherton to the museum, where you see only one of the pieces of the Yugen. But I see this as a cloudy mountain, um, a contemporary, uh, you get this sort of rugged cliff face in the foreground, and then the atmospheric uh, clouds in the background. So again, it is this uh, ink painting aesthetic moved into contemporary abstraction. Um, Hasegawa's ambitious experimentation with Asian classical art formats and techniques. Uh, he often used, uh, worked with folding screens. Like, this is a two-panel folding screen and ink rubbing uh, to, and ink rubbing, of course, in Japanese and Chinese art is typically used to record architectural embellishments and incised calligraphy, uh, but he used it on broken down fragments of things that he found after the war. Uh, the scholar Eugenia Bogdanova Kumler has discussed Hasegawa's bicultural awareness, <coughs> excuse me, of rubbing as an art technique with a parallel European modernist history associated with Max Ernst, uh, known as frottage. As central to his cosmopolitanism, Hasegawa promoted maintaining a strong foundation in multiple Asian artistic sources. <clears throat> For Hasegawa, aspects of Japan's aesthetic philosophical past were related to his pacifism and his years of isolation during the war. But in Japan, when works like this were uh, showcased, he was accused of being retardataire and neo-nationalist. Although some artists in Japan embraced his work, the Japan art, art writer Elise Greeley, who was one of his advocates, said that the Japanese art community was generally very dubious of his intentions, but said, well, many a prophet is without honor in his own country. I believe Hasegawa's strongest work dates from the early 1950s, such as this piece, which is called Rhapsody Fishing Village. A lot of his work has musical titles, uh, which he made in that tiny house in Tsuchido, Fujisawa Prefecture, surrounded by family. He abandoned all oil painting altogether in 1950, and his new work included folding screens and many scroll paintings. Uh, so this is again uh, an example of one of the rubbings, and it is as if his world was exploded. He also made photograms of uh, smashed glass during this period, so it's like he's scavenging the remnants of the war to uh, invent something new that is a non-traditional approach uh, to rubbing and block printing. Um, by the way, this painting was first exhibited in San Francisco in 1952, and Alfred Frankenstein gave his work a rave review. There was a show called New Work from Contemporary Art from Japan. Frankenstein said, a particular interest is this folding screen by Hasegawa, which has these rubbings. So Frankenstein uh, was an early proponent. Um, and another thing that he did, this is again one of the uh, block prints using the fish cake trays. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, the circumstances of this for a moment. Hasegawa in 1950 became an important friend to Isamo Noguchi. Hasegawa taught him, took him on a tour. They went to Rio Anji. He talked to him about uh, tea ceremony and all of that uh, actually had a profound impact on Noguchi's thinking. And then Noguchi introduced Hasegawa to the work of Franz Klein. Um, I'll come back to this, but here is Franz Klein's own painting named Saburo. Uh, and Hasegawa wrote about Klein and his engagement with Japanese art. And the letters between Klein and Hasegawa are so fascinating. And Klein said, I remember when I was 13 and I went to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and I was so blown away by their collection, particularly of Japanese art. It is then and there that I decided to become an artist. But after Clement Greenberg said that Asian art was effeminate, Franz Klein later retracted those statements. Um, it's a, that's another whole story. Uh, but um, 
Klein arranged for a solo exhibition of Hasegawa in New York in 1953, and because of that, Hasegawa was invited uh, to also curate an exhibition of contemporary art from Japan that was uh, displayed at the Riverside Museum. So here is Noguchi explaining Hasegawa's poem, a uh, poetic piece which is called Symphonic Poem, One Fine Day, again another musical title. You can see it has that sort of Broadway boogie-woogie kind of uh, quality to it. Um, and that's from the 1954 exhibition at the Riverside Museum in New York. At the same year, Hasegawa lectured at the Museum of Modern Art on a panel with Joseph Albers and Franz Klein. And uh, he lectured on four occasions at the 8th Street Club, where many of New York's most prominent abstract expressionists were in attendance. Uh, he and D.T. Suzuki were really key people in uh, sort of bringing Zen to uh, the New York avant-garde. Hasegawa's solo show in New York in 1954 at the Contemporaries Gallery was something of a hero's welcome. I've seen the guest book. It's signed by Dory Ashton, Alfred Barr, Louise Bourgeois, Marcel Duchamp, Charles Egan, Susie Gablick, Franz Klein, Fairfield Porter, the list goes on and on. It's an incredible group of people. Uh, he was invited to many dinner parties. He served tea to Duchamp, and Hans Richter uh, had a spectacular year, but nobody offered him a job. So he, reluctantly, he left New York and stopped in San Francisco again because he had had these regular shows here, and... By that point, Alan Watts was the dean of the American Academy of Asian Studies, and so he invited Hasegawa to be an artist in residence. Hasegawa appeared on KRON TV, demonstrating tea ceremony in 1954, and uh, also did lectures on Asian art history at CCAC, the California College of Arts and Crafts, and as a result, CCAC invited him to join the faculty teaching both drawing and um, Asian art history. I forgot to show this, talk about the image on the right, but just when Hasegawa was in New York for those 11 months, uh, he painted in Franz Klein's studio. Uh, Klein gave him a key, and his work was totally changed because he didn't have all that material to make the complicated rubbings. There was no mounters there. So he made these, uh, I'm going to call them Zen paintings, and uh, he uh, was illustrating chapters from the Tao. So I just wanted to read this one because all of them are wonderful. I'm sorry the photograph isn't so good. Uh, but the text reads, uh, and it's about um, the characteristics of a virtuous life. Food is plain and good. Clothes fine but simple. Homes secure. They live within sight of their neighbors. Crowing cocks and barking dogs are always heard throughout the night. Yet they leave each other in peace, and they grow old and die. So for any of you who have had a barking dog, I think chapter 80 from the Tao is a, <laughs> is a good reference. Um, so uh, when Hasegawa lived in Japan, he wore blue jeans and was kind of a crazy artist. But when he moved to teach, when he moved to San Francisco, he wore... Japanese robes. They lived on Webster Street in Japantown with his family. And these are two sort of poor photos of Hasegawa teaching at CCAC from the collection of the Oakland Museum. Um, Watts, Alan Watts and Hasegawa were very close. Alan Watts said Hasegawa was the most articulate teacher of Zen he had ever encountered. At CCAC, Hasegawa became a charismatic teacher of drawing. As Charlie Gill said, hair was getting longer and mysticism was in the air. Uh, as a member of the faculty, he occupied an almost antipodal relationship to the influence of Richard Diebenkorn, whose work is also on display, whose abstract expressionist paintings reference landscape. Renowned Los Angeles artist Billy Al Bengston was a student of Hasegawa at CCAC at that time. And he recalled, Has this is a quote, Hasegawa's personality has always stuck with me. I have no idea what was on my mind at that time, but he came across loud and clear. By contrast, Diebenkorn, who was my friend, seemed like a jerk, a conservative army vet who was trying to make a living. But Saburo was majestic. He held a room. He was so fucking cool. <laughs> Other students that I've happily been able to talk to include Bruce McGaw, Bernice Bing, who both reported that it was Hasegawa who first exposed them to Buddhism and Taoism. According to Bernice Bing, she experienced Hasegawa's teaching as a focus on mental attitude and identity, 
and he was her first and most profound influence in Asian thought. Uh, and she has a wonderful quote on her website. Uh, of course, Bernice is now passed, but you can look it up. She said, I had no idea what it meant to be an Asian woman artist, but he got me started to think about that. I am still in awe. Um, his lectures at the American Academy of Asian Studies were also very well attended. Uh, if the people who've, anyway, the, the list of people who attended is quite spectacular, but I'll just mention one, which is Gary Snyder. And uh, thanks to a friend in the audience who helped me speak to Gary about this. And I'm going to read a quote from Gary. In the winter of 1955-56, a remarkable artist from Japan, Saburo Hasegawa, was in residence at the Academy of Asian Studies. I attended some of his lectures. I never saw him wearing Western clothes. He was always in formal kimono and hakama. He spoke of East Asian landscape painting as a meditation. He said that landscape paintings were for Zen as instructively and deeply Buddhist as the tankas and mandalas are for Tibetan Buddhism. At some point, Hasegawa heard that I had never tasted the ceremonial powdered green tea, and he delightedly invited me to his apartment in the academy. I still remember the day, April 8, 1956, because it was also Buddha's birthday. He frothed up the tea with a bamboo whisk. We chatted at length about the great Japanese Zen monk painter Seshu. As I left that day, I resolved to start a long poem that would be entitled Mountains and Rivers Without End. In 1956, Hasegawa conceived and curated an expansive Japanese culture festival in Oakland. It was called Bunkasai. It was the first phase of which included a proposal to bring 5,000 blossoming cherry, cherry trees to Ring Lake Merritt and an exhibition at the Oakland Art Museum called The Modern Spirit in Japanese Art. The exhibition was multifaceted and included works from different historical periods. Among them, contemporary calligraphy for an exhibition that Hasegawa had organized at the New York Museum of Modern Art, as well as rare Zen paintings from Japanese collections by pre-Meiji Japanese monks who Hasegawa admired, like Hakuen, here and Sengai. Sculptural works by Isamu Noguchi, lent by New York Stable Gallery, were presented alongside Haniwa, lent from a college in Tokyo, as well as works by Bay Area artist J.B. Blunk, who Hasegawa had met in Japan. Hasegawa's own work in that exhibition included his block prints and rubbings and a new body of huge calligraphy works in ink created with a broom on 10-foot wall boards and burlap. These works were very, and there's Blunk in the foreground and some of Hasegawa's work in the background. These works were very dark in content and were melancholic meditations on mortality. The panel on the left is the Basho death poem. A translation is stricken on a journey. My dreams go wandering around withered fields. The last painting he made was a 10-foot painting on burlap, which translates as pure suffering, created in archaic Chinese calligraphy. Japanese scholar Koichi Kawasaki has described the innovative curatorial conception that spanned ancient to contemporary periods as Hasegawa's Museum of the Imagination, and it is still a visionary project. Like Takashi Murakami's 2001 Superflat exhibition project, Hasegawa's Bunkasai reinterpreted historical Japanese art as avant-garde. He moved with his family. This is just before they left Japan into a second floor apartment on Webster Street, but soon after Hasegawa fell ill. He had long been a cigarette smoker and he developed a mouth cancer that did not respond to treatment. He traveled to Texas to visit a clinic which Alan Watts described in, to, in a letter to Noguchi as totally quack, to no avail. By late 1956, it was clear Hasegawa was dying. His work was featured in a solo exhibition hastily arranged by Grace McCann Morley at SF MoMA, and he attended in a wheelchair, <laughs> and he died. March 11, 1957, his funeral was held at Sokoji Zen Mission, officiated by Wako Kato, some of you probably know him who was then a young academic and priest. 
In assessing Hasegawa's mid-century profile on the American East and West Coast, it becomes clear that this artist pioneered what we might today discuss as transnationalism and a vision of global Asia. Hasegawa's project of reconciling Asian classical themes and modernist inventions continues to have rich resonance. You can tell I'm emotional because <laughs> I've got to know all the family. And, you know, one by one, they've moved into heaven. And so I'm so glad to be able to bring uh, their story to you today. Thank you very much. Aren't we all lucky to be so enriched by this exhibition? It's a lot of work, but it's worth it because what we are brought by Larry and crew is visions of things we don't know anything about. I looked very much forward to being here today, and my opening remark was going to be, none of you have ever heard of Ruth Wall, and she would have liked it that way. But I look out at this audience, and I see many friends of mine and of Ruth Wall's, so I'm glad to be here to just talk to you today about Ruth. I have no slides. I have no prepared text. I'm just going to talk to you about Ruth as I would if Ruth were here. Sitting with me, she wouldn't talk. I can tell you that. But um, in talking about Ruth, I'm going to, oh, I think I have to stay by the mic. In talking about Ruth, I'm going to be talking a little bit about myself, which isn't really comfortable, but it's how I met Ruth. She... I opened a gallery in the early 80s in Berkeley devoted to resale because I didn't think there was any place for people to go. There was no internet, there were no contemporary auctions, and people who owned works that they wanted or needed to sell had no avenue. So I jumped in. I knew a little bit more about press releases than I did about art, so I was smart enough to write a press release picked up by many, many local and national uh, outlets, and one of the persons who picked up on it was Ruth Wall. And she came up the stairs of my gallery, which was on Shattuck near Chez Panisse, carrying a newspaper clipping in one hand and a string bag in another hand, and said, I need you. And it turned out that Ruth had a lot of collections. She traveled widely. She went to art school. This is bookended with Kevin. She went to art school at the Art Institute when it was a hotbed of creativity. She traded with her fellow artists and picked up things on her travels. And she was on a big quest. She was 69 years old at this time. And her major quest was to, excuse the phrase, get rid of some of her holdings because she had more things than she thought was appropriate. So over the next 20 years, Ruth came to visit my galleries in several locations, bringing her string bag, she didn't drive, and treasures for me to sell. And I repeatedly asked Ruth, well, if you've got all these things you've traded with people like Roy DeForest, what about your own work? Let me see what, you're, what you did. And she met that request with total silence. Then eventually in the string bags came some sculptures that were by Ruth things that she made out of found objects. Some of them were old telephone sets or cables, anything she found. And some small notebooks of her work. And it took me 20 years to get to do an exhibition of Ruth's work, which came about only because of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And that was an earthquake that set Ruth on a, on a mission not be the keeper, as she called it, of Miriam Hoffman, a fellow student of hers at the Art Institute. At um, Yes, at the Art Institute. And Ruth said, I can't be Miriam's keeper anymore, so she allowed me to come to her apartment. I was one of the only people to ever walk across that threshold into her apartment. Um, and I was amazed at what I saw when I got there. Ruth was a hoarder. Now, she wasn't the 
hoarder type that makes you want to put glass gloves on. She was a hoarder of things visual. The entryway of her apartment was completely covered in umbrella ribs. She had found a lot of umbrellas on the street. She ripped the fabric off the umbrellas and hang them upside down, and then she would hang things on the ribs of the umbrella. So you walked in under a canopy of found and made objects by Ruth Wall. And that was just one of the kind of examples what I found there. And there was a closed door. And I said, what's behind that door? And she said, not much. Well, I finally got her to open the door, and it was wall to, not floor to ceiling, but wall to wall abstract expressionist paintings that she had made at the Art Institute. And when I say that, what I was gonna to say to you in the beginning is she would like it that way if you hadn't heard of her. She had no interest in a career at this point in her life. She was only compelled to make work, not to show it, not to get any fame, not to get any money. She just was compelled to make art. And I came today without visuals because I'm not good at that, but I'm an old fifth grade school teacher. So I'm here with show and tell. And I'm going to tell you some stories about Ruth, and I'm going to show you some work. This painting on the easel I brought because I had it and I could carry it. And it's very typical of Ruth in its palette. It's an abstract expressionist painting which she, like Jacobus, made at the Art Institute when she was torn between her teacher David Park and her teacher Clifford Still. She went from abstraction to figuration, back and forth. She didn't seem particularly conflicted by that. That was something that she just was absorbing. Um, before I talk about this painting, I want to tell you Ruth was born and raised on an Indian reservation. She had never seen art. There was no art in her house. She was never exposed to art. She was never in a museum. She served in World War II, trained to ferry uh, planes uh, from their manufacturer to the battlefield. And by the time she got her 50 solo flights in, um, the men were coming back from war and they didn't need her. So she was trained as a physical therapist, worked at Letterman Hospital until, as she said, she got tired of patching up the mangled people from war. Um, so Ruth was completely uh, naive to art. She absorbed it all with great passion. She had no money. She was living on the GI Bill. So she used whatever materials were at hand. Very fond of um, found objects. This painting, typical in its abstract style. It's also made on a board. And if I can release it here. It's signed on the back. And it's, it's, a, it's on a board, which she found. She signed it on the back for a reason. She said, I make it, but it's not up to me to say how you want to look at it. So if you want to look at it, horizontally, vertically, upside down, it's up to you. And that was very much in her nature, is to invite you to be a participant in her work. So 20 years after I met her, I had an exhibition of her abstract expressionist work, very well attended, including by Ruth, which was a big surprise. She had not intended to come because she doesn't, didn't want to talk to people about her art. She sat in a chair in her blue jeans and smiled politely at people and refused to answer questions. Therefore, there's a, I know that Larry has said I'm her biographer, I only wish. I tried so hard to learn about her. I had no knowledge of her background, the little bit I got. But when I said I want to do an exhibition of these abstract paintings, she was delighted because she wanted to get rid of them. Um, she didn't care who bought them. As she said to me, I called her up once to tell her that some famous person had bought a painting. And her response was, it matters not more or less where the children go when they leave the house. So she had, she had very little interest in any, in any careerism, but she did come to visit me for 20 years, at least once a week, with a string bag with things in it. Sculptures, things she had traded, small notebooks of her own, and we fought. And the thing we fought over was how much these things should be. 
I want to show you a notebook. Not, many of you can't see, you're too far away, but I'm going to do show and tell in the lobby afterwards because I brought a lot of Ruth's work with me. But she would bring me these great notebooks of her own work. And I'd say, oh, Ruth, we can't, we can't break this up. And she said, oh, don't be ridiculous. Nobody's going on a whole book of my drawings. And I said, well, how much do you want me to sell them for? And she said, oh, $10. And I would fight with her and say, Ruth, we can't sell this for $10. We have to sell it for more. But we fought. I won because she went home. And then I just sold them for a little bit more than she thought. But the work is really quite marvelous. And I'm going to invite you to join me in the lobby if you want to see more of it. So 20 years later, we did a show. And I thought, well, that'll be the end of this relationship. That was only the beginning. Because she came to visit me for years afterwards, at least once a week. And I, more than once a week, I got mail from her. She made her own envelopes. She wouldn't use a commercial envelope. She made her, all, her own envelopes, and they were all collages. And I have some here for you to see. They were magnificent. And each envelope was filled with clippings that she wanted to be sure I'd seen about art things in the newspaper or art news. So she became a very big part of, of my life after that show when I thought I would not see her much anymore. And then one day, about, I don't know, maybe eight years after the show, I got a call from the San Francisco police. And they said, we have Ruth Wall with us in protective custody. And I said, they, they found her wandering the streets of North Beach, waving her checkbook. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How come you got to me? And they said, well, we took her home. And she had a neatly labeled folder on her kitchen table that said legal affairs. And you are her guardian, her durable power of attorney for finances, the executor of her will, the durable power of attorney for health care. And she's now at San Francisco General Hospital, and you have to go get her. And I was astonished. I was just astonished. And I said to this policeman and then later to the social work at, worker at the hospital, I don't know anything about this woman. Has she ever been married? Does she have children? What are her religious um, beliefs? So that was the middle of this story. Um, it ended up she was in the hospital and incoherent because she was dehydrated. They treated her at the hospital, and then they said, you have to take her home. And I said to the attorney who had written this will, I don't want any of these responsibilities. They're not appropriate. I don't know anything about this woman. And this social worker said to me, well, she's named a second person to be all of these things, and it's someone you must know. His name is Dan Carlevaro. Well, that's my husband, Dan, who's sitting here, and who knew less about Ruth than I did. So together, together, Dan and I managed to find a family member in Utah, her brother-in-law, uh, her brother in Utah, and her brother was in a care facility with Alzheimer's. And his wife said, I'm strong as an ox. I'm a nurse. If you can get her here, I'll take care of her, and I'll take all of those obligations from you, all these durable powers, if you take care of Ruth's possessions. We don't want to come out there. We have no interest in her art. We don't know what's there, and we don't want to know. You take care of her possessions. We'll take care of her. And that began a new story of my association with wonderful Ruth Wall. Because Dan and I did take care. We got the key to her apartment. We went in. And as, as I mentioned, I don't think anybody had ever been in that apartment. She lived there 50 years. It was on Lombard Street, just up from the, um, from the art school, on the wrong side of Lombard Street, across from Columbus. And she had all her possessions there. And Dan and I managed to get rid of a lot of them. The books, thousands of volumes of books, went to the Friends of the Library. Clothing went to Goodwill. And we were mopping up this enterprise 
the very kind of last day of this, and we had one 800 got junk in to take the things, you know, kitchen stuff. By the way, she had a kitchen, which she never used. She never ate at home. She had a small refrigerator, and that was it. So these 1-800-GOT-JUNK people came in, and they said, do you want us to take the bookcases? And I said, yeah, take the bookcases. Well, the bookcases were everywhere, and they were nailed to the wall. So they pulled the bookcases away from the wall and out tumbled seven portfolios of prints, abstract expressionist prints, all made in 1952 in an eight-month period. And I, I just about passed out well, from the task of clearing out her apartment, but I don't know how many of you have ever smelled lithography ink. It's very strong. And I had gathered that Ruth brought, brought these prints home, put them in these portfolios, put the portfolios behind the bookcases, and never looked at them or thought of them again. And that is, was my next saga of Ruth Wall. I didn't know what, I knew I had something important, but I didn't know what, so I drove up to see a man named Dan Lenau, who owns a gallery in Santa Rosa, and he's a print specialist. And he looked at me, and he looked at them, and he said, oh my God, you've got a problem and an opportunity. This, this is fabulous, because abstract expressionist artists don't make prints very often. They're about spontaneity and creativity, and prints are much more labor-intensive, and there is no body of work like this. We had 522 lithographs. So there began another saga, and I have one more, uh, with Ruth Wall, was what to do with 522 lithographs. So I published a book on her lithographs, and I have a copy of it here if anybody wants to see it. And I, I titled the book Love of the Stone. And it turned out that Ruth, she never talked to me about these prints. She had never shown them to anybody. What she would do was go up to the Art Institute at night when it was, everyone was gone, but the doors were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week at the Art Institute. She would go up there when she was assured she'd be alone, and she would make these prints. And she made them herself with no help, and she labeled them, titled them, and signed them, which it was unlike most ABEX artists did with prints, but she never did it consistently. So in one print, it would be horizontal. In another one, it would be vertical. Sometimes it would be on the back. Sometimes it would be signed Ruth, sometimes Ruth Wall. So I have documented this body of work in, in a book called Love of the Stone, another very interesting experience with Ruth. Um, and there was one other. In her apartment, there was an old, really old, dusty metal trunk. And I knew enough to look in it. And I looked in it, and there were a lot of photographs from her travels, and then some clothes. So I closed it up and said, I'm going to give this to 1-800-GOT-JUNK and let them take care of it. But before it went out the door, we dug down into the bottom of the trunk, and we found another discovery, 50 books notebooks filled with Ruth's writings. Um, she called it her um, abortive offspring. She filled 50 books with writings of her life, her observations. It wasn't a diary. They weren't poems. They were observations and thoughts. And that's my next chapter with Ruth Wall, is what to do with 50 wonderful books of sayings. I didn't want to do anything with them while any of her family members were still alive because there were some very personal things in there. But I have those books, some of those books for you to see too. So I've had a long career with Ruth Wall without ever really knowing as much about her as I would have wished. And that's the present that Larry and this museum have given us is kind of entree to people like Ruth Wall, people who make work who make it for reasons that have nothing to do with careerism, and then what happens? And that's a question I want to leave you with, because it's not a question unique to Ruth Wall. There's an article in the New York Times yesterday about artists and their legacy and what do they do. No problem if you're David Park or Richard Diebenkorn, but what if you're not? 
what happens to this work? What's my responsibility for Ruth Wall and many other artists who I met in my travels um, who, who leave us these wonderful bodies of work for whatever reason, and we don't know what to do with them. So come join me in the lobby, look at some of Ruth Wall's work, and help me answer that question. Thank you for being here. And I have some old friends here, which is so surprising to me. One major collector of Ruth Wall's work, David Keaton, is in the audience. And he is a person who bought many, many Ruth Walls from me, and I'm delighted. Roger Perotti, who was a friend of the gallery. And it's nice to see some of my friends and all of you here. I wish you were all my friends. Thank you very much. Thank you.